Hi. Um, my name is Nancy Scazzari. I'm with Queen Anne's County Planning and Zoning, and I'd like to welcome you all tonight to the um, Critical Area Mapping Update Meeting. You're, if you're here with a letter, it's because there was some impact, 1% greater, on your property of the limits of critical area, maybe more in, maybe more out. Um, we have critical area commission staff here with us tonight. They're manning the tables with the computers. And if you want to stay, we're here till 9 o'clock to help you uh, look up your property and tell you what the impacts mean to you. We're about ready to get going with a presentation that will introduce you to critical areas if you're not familiar and tell you more about the update. So I'd like to introduce Lisa Herger and Ryan Mello from Critical Area Commission, and they're going to do the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. I am Lisa Herger. I'm the person that wrote you the letter that you received in the mail. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming out. Um, we're really glad that you all have come out because a lot of times we go to public meetings and we don't get anybody. So we know that you have lots of questions. Um, and as Nancy said, we have staff manning tables to my right and staff manning tables to my left. Um, you're welcome to get up at any time and go to one of those stations. Um, they will continue operating while I'm speaking. And uh, as Nancy said, we will stay after the presentation um, for those of you who haven't had a chance to do that yet, if you want to listen to the presentation. It will be a brief presentation. I am going to give you an introduction to the critical area, what it means, and essentially what it means for you if you received a letter from our office explaining that your property is affected by this boundary line change. So I'm going to get started with that. So the first question that I've heard already a couple times tonight is what is the critical area? I don't know what it means. And I wouldn't know what it means either if I didn't work for the commission. But um, it goes back to the early 1970s. And for those of you that were living in Maryland then, you may remember Governor Harry Hughes. And during um, his administration, um, the Environmental Protection Agency did a study on the Chesapeake Bay, and some of you might be familiar with that. And it was kind of a watershed event as far as the Bay Program and the future of how the state was going to view not only development on the land, but how we treat the resource itself. So in 1984, the General Assembly passed a law, and it was called the Critical Area Act. And what it told us to do was to come up with a set of development regulations, which were um, promulgated in 1985, a year later. And the way that the program works is that each local government that surrounds the Chesapeake Bay or its tidal tributaries, which obviously Queen Anne's County does, will have within its local zoning ordinances development ordinances, the development standards that were promulgated by the commission in 1985. Now the critical area itself um, is a thousand feet from tidal waters and tidal wetlands, which was explained in your letter. And you can probably see that on your letter and we can show you that um, right here tonight. After I'm done speaking, Ryan is going to speak briefly about how we did the actual mapping from the existing critical area boundary line to the one that's shown on your letter. The, the critical area program is essentially a land use and resource conservation area program. So what does that mean? It boils down to this. If you are in the critical area, and you are proposing to do development, you will have some development requirements beyond what you might already have to do for the zoning that's on your property. And I'm going to talk about those in a minute and what the differences are. As I explained, the critical area is not only a thousand feet from tidal wetlands and tidal waters, but it also includes all the lands under the bay and it's about 11% of the entire state of Maryland. So why are we updating the 1,000-foot boundary line? 
The original line that is on your letters is based on mapping resources that the state had available to it back in 1984, 1985 timeframe. And those maps are called the 1972 state tidal wetlands maps. And those maps, while the actual date of them is 1972, many of that aerial photography was flown in the 1960s. But those were the best resource that the state had at the time to figure out where is this thousand foot boundary line gonna be in all these counties and where what lands will fall within it. So those were the maps that were used back in the late 80s and early 90s to determine the extent of the critical area in the counties. And what we've learned and what you all probably are aware of that live near the water is that you know in 40 years time, we've had a lot of erosion or accretion or subsidence of land, which means that the way that thousand foot boundary line is drawn has changed. So if you measure the edge of a line from a point off the edge of a wetland and that wetland has shifted or the edge of that tidal water has shifted, the line would shift. In 2008, the General Assembly had enact, actually they passed a bill that required the Critical Area Commission to remap the thousand foot critical area boundary line based on current aerial imagery and other mapping resources that are available to us today. And as I said, Ryan, after I speak, is going to about what specific resources were used to identify the new edge of shoreline and tidal wetlands that results in the in the thousand foot boundary line changes. The other reasons that we're doing this and the reason that the General Assembly wanted us to update these thousand foot boundary lines across the county was for the obvious reason that we wanted it to be accurate. And two, um, with technology as it is today and the increase in use of the internet, we wanted the maps to be web accessible to all the citizens that have access to the internet. And we wanted the line to match up. Um, if you look at the current maps now, sometimes the lines don't match. The thousand foot boundary line waves and it's not very accurate because it was drawn with a magic marker. So you can imagine the inaccuracy involved in drawing a line with a magic marker. So the House bill was 1253 that required that the 1972 maps um, be used as the base line, which is on your letter. And from there, we redigitized the shoreline and wetland edges and drew this proposed line that is on your letter also. We have worked probably two to three years on Queen Anne's County. Um, this has not been something that just happens overnight, despite the fact that we have great technology. Um, we did a lot of back and forth with county staff. There are places in the county where we actually couldn't tell where the edge of tidal waters or tidal wetlands were. So we, if we were granted permission to go on private properties, we went out and we ground truth those areas where we could not tell from the information that we had available on the desktop. So the burning question is, what does this mean for my property if the new proposed line falls on my property? And a lot of you got uh, pictures that look very similar to the one on the screen, which shows a boundary line that is a broken line, which is the current uh, legally binding critical area line in Queen Anne's County. And then you got a solid line, which is the proposed critical area boundary line based on remapping, again, the edge of those wetlands and tidal waters. And for some folks, um, they are now in the critical area for the first time. For some of you, maybe part of your property was already in the critical area, and now more of it or all of it is. And for other folks, you might be out of the critical area now where by you were before. That has actually happened. So 
if the line has changed on your property, it means that at least that portion of your property that is within the critical area is subject to the development standards that I spoke of earlier. All of the development standards are in the Queen Anne's County Ordinance. And I'm going to tell you what they are. But the first question that you should have if you're planning to do development or redevelopment on your property, you know you're in the critical area, is what is my critical area designation? And critical area designations are very similar to how the zoning works on your property. So everyone here has some type of zoning that's on their property. It could be residential, it could be commercial, it could be agricultural. And that zoning requires certain standards that you have to meet when you pull a permit to do a development activity. The critical area designations work the same way. So if you got a letter and the um, designation on your property that's proposed is an IDA, an intensely developed area, the additional development standard that you would have to meet if you were in an IDA or an intensely developed area, and on your letter it would be red, and if you're not sure, please ask us, is that you would have to perform some stormwater management on the property. Now, for some of you, if, if you're proposing new development and it's 5,000 square feet or greater, you're going to have to do stormwater anyway according to the state requirements from the Maryland Department of the Environment and Queen Anne's County. And what we've been finding is that most of the time, if you're already meeting the county requirements, you're automatically meeting the critical area stormwater requirement. The other two categories are limited development area, LDA, if you hear us speak it, it's LDA, and resource conservation area. Both of those uh, critical area classifications have ver are very similar as far as what the development requirements would be. If your letter is yellow, you are in a limited development area. If your letter is green, you're in a resource conservation area. Both of those designations would require a lot coverage limitation. So if you came in for a building permit, the county would look at the size of your lot, and generally the lot coverage limitation is 15% of the lot or parcel that is inside the critical area. For lots that are smaller than one half acre, there are provisions to allow greater than 15%. The other thing to note is, your underlying zoning in some cases might likely already restrict your lot coverage. Um, so that's something that you will want to ask one of the county folks if you have a chance tonight. The other restriction in a limited development area or a resource conservation area is that if you're planning to clear any forest on your lot or parcel, you have a limit of up to 20% of that area and you would have to replace the forest but that's assuming if you had to cut any trees. If you're not cutting any forest, then you don't have a forest replacement requirement. There's one additional restriction for folks that are in a resource conservation area, and that has to do with density. The density in a resource conservation area is one dwelling unit per 20 acres. So if you have 20 acres, you get one dwelling unit. If you got 40 acres, you get two, and so on. The other point to make about that, I spoke with a, a woman earlier tonight, is you might want to check with the county to see what your current underlying zoning is on your property, because many times a county's rural zoning is the same density restriction as critical area. So it may be there's no net effect, but you need to know what your underlying zoning is. So another question we get um, at these meetings, and we've been to some other counties already, we've uh, finished Talbot and Prince George's and Calvert, is um, if I have existing uses or structures, does that mean I have to do something different? No. Everything that is existing as today can remain on your property, and any type of use that you currently have on your property can continue on your property, regardless of how the critical area boundary might be shifting on your lot or parcel. Um, I am going to turn it over to Ryan at this point, 
and he is going to talk to you about the mapping. Again, we're, we're going to be available to all of you after Ryan's finished. We'll take questions from the audience, and then we will be here to continue to answer any questions you still might have. Thank you. Okay. Let's try to fix this. Uh, as Lisa said, my name is Ryan, and I am the GIS coordinator for the Critical Area Commission. Basically, my job is to work with the counties, the Critical Area Commission, and Salisbury University to make the maps that you see. So I'm going to show you an example of how we go through the process and what we do. And then at the end, I'm going to show you some common review points that we have that come up and how we address those points. So the very first step we do for a county is we get all the imagery we can for that, that county. The first most important imagery that we have is the true color imagery. That's basically what is on the ground at the time it's flown. We use this imagery to create the shoreline. That's the first step. We do the whole county at once. And we'll go through and draw. We'll use um, mean high tide to determine where the line will be. Because of the way that the counties are shaped, a lot of times we'll have high tide in one area, we'll have low tide in another one. So we try to go the average area. Um, beaches are actually really kind of easy to map because you see where the high tide mark is and where the water is now, and we kind of average that out. Um, we also take into account trees hanging over the water to determine where we want to put the shoreline. The next step, once we have the entire shoreline together, we reviewed that, we go through and draw the wetlands. The most important imagery we use for the wetlands is called color infrared, or CIR. Basically what that is, is it shows photosynthesis of plants. So green grass, green trees, that shows up as bright neon red. Um, tidal grasses usually show up as beige or brown. So just looking at the color infrared, it shows you pretty good areas of where the wetlands are. So we're going to start with those, and we're also going to compare them to a lot of other data sets to confirm what we are mapping is tidal wetlands. Um, again, we use tree shadow. We try to average those out. Um, and we also have to use a lot of different data sets to confirm what we have. These are the original 72 wetland maps. We take these, we scan them, and we georeference them to make them fit to what we have now. Obviously, these are 30, 40 years old, and they are going to be different than what is on the ground now. So we don't go based on exactly what's there. But if there was a wetland there in the 72, it's a good chance it's still there now. So we use that as a definitive, yes, there was a wetland, there still is a wetland here. We also use topography to show how high the area is. Normally, a tidal wetland doesn't go above four feet. There are examples, there are exceptions to that, but for the most part, they don't go above four feet, especially if they're located right on the water. LIDAR, however, is probably the best tool we have for topography because it averages out and it makes a lot cleaner image for us to look at. The contours, if you can see those, are kind of patchy, and sometimes grasses can set those off. But if we have LIDAR, it kind of smooths everything out and makes the line a little bit easier. So as long as we have LIDAR, contour, color infrared, and all of that showing what we have looks tidal, and there was a tidal wetland in there before, then we usually are pretty, pretty sure that we have a wetland still. So once we go through all of the shoreline, all of the wetlands, we set up review points. Each county probably starts out with six, 700 review points. Every single wetland we draw has a review point. Then we set up WebExes, and basically that's where we get in a call with the county, with the state, with DNR, with MDE, and we have everybody in the same call, and we go through point by point of what we have. We look through permits, we look through other data, wetland delineations, we use those to confirm what we have, change what we have, and then we narrow this list of five, 600 down to less than 100, and that's where we do site visits and go out and confirm what we don't already have. So these are some of the common examples and issues that we have coming out. Obviously, a loss of wetlands in this image. Uh, the green arrow, if, it's hardly hard to see in the back, but the green arrow shows where the edge of wetland was in 72. And now the yellow line, which is closer to the water, is where we are mapping the tidal wetlands now. So this will bring back the critical area. So if you're on the edge of it, you're probably being brought out of it now based on new tidal data that we have. This is an extension of critical area. Um, in the 72, there was a road that kind of cut across the wetland, and that road has been washed out or taken out for whatever reason, and now the wetland has crept up, and this will push the critical area out, which will bring people into it. 
and this is just er showing erosion. The green arrow at the top is showing you where the, uh, the 72 shoreline was, and now the blue line is showing you where it is now. That's gonna push the critical area landward more. Um, this is a peninsula, so it's kind of hard to, to push it back because it's gonna get it from all sides, but I just wanted to show that there is a lot of erosion in this issue. The final product that we have coming to you is the web map. This is where we put the data that we have had reviewed through multiple years of reviews um, with the county, with the state. We've gone out and done site visits. This is our finalized um, proposed boundary. Um, there are changes that could come up possibly, but we want to move forward with this. So the red line is, if you haven't already seen the web map, the red line is showing you what was there before, and the black dotted line is where you will be now. And this is the web map. You have a link to it on the letter you got. You can put in your address and that'll put you right to it. Um, if you wanna look at what you have, the little image on the bottom, if that's not enough for you to look at, you can zoom around on that. Also, all of our computers we have here tonight, they'll bring it up and we'll be able to show you the water and where the changes were that are affecting you on your property. So now I'm gonna turn it back to Lisa and we're gonna go over any questions that you have if not, we're going to move on towards one-on-one -on -one with you. Yes, sir. It is a, the thousand foot boundary is essentially what the legislature debated it would be. Um, they had to pick a number and it had to be a round number. So there, there isn't really any science behind it. Um, it's about political compromise. So that's kind of where the number came from. Well, we know that when you think of a watershed, which is much bigger than the thousand foot boundary, that everything that happens in there affects the receiving water bodies. So what we have found is there has been studies on lot coverage limits, the ones that I spoke about earlier. And essentially the new data that's been coming out is telling us that the threshold in a watershed before the water quality degrades is at 8%. And when they passed our law back in 84, they have it at 15. And it currently, as I said, allows greater than that. But that's some of the data that we have as far as the threshold capability when we're talking about lot coverage in a watershed. Um, and there certainly has been many other studies. Um, if you want to get with me afterwards, I can talk to you about that. We can point you to those studies. To Did everybody hear the question? Uh, maybe not. Whether the, what the thousand foot boundary line is based on and whether there's been studies that have proven its viability essentially. Okay. The question is when does the new proposed boundary go into effect? And we don't have a specific date yet. We're holding two public meetings. One is tonight, one is tomorrow night in Centerville. After these public meetings, we're gonna look at the maps one more time. Um, if there are any more questions concerning where the line is drawn, we're gonna try and rectify those, assuming there are. And once we feel like the maps are fairly close to ready, we will officially trans, the state will officially transmit those maps to Queen Anne's County government. And at that time, the county will take the maps through the legislative process before your county commissioners. So what I would recommend to you is that you check in their website, um, see what their agendas are, but I suspect it'll be at least a couple months off from now. The county approves the boundary, and once the commissioners have approved it, it comes to the critical area commission and they have the final approval. So even after the commissioners have adopted it, it has one more step before their official lines. Oh, and excuse me, and in, in Queen Anne's case, after our commission approves the maps, it does come back to your commissioners one more time. You all have an extra public process in Queen Anne's County. Yes, ma'am. The question was whether the two sets of maps that we currently have available, which are the 72s and the ones that we have proposed, where it shows a loss of land along the shoreline, whether a property owner can reclaim that loss. And that question, um, essentially the answer is no, to my knowledge. 
but I can get back to you. Um, that is governed by the Maryland Department of the Environment, not our agency, and they will be the folks that could answer that question succinctly. There are certain things in their statute that you'd have to meet in order to reclaim, but the general answer is no. Yes, sir. The question was, if you're in the critical area and you have to tear down and rebuild your home, can you still do that? And the answer is yes. What if you sell it? Yes. The new owner can build the same home. Um, if it's waterfront and there's a minimum 100-foot setback, if you're on tidal waters or tidal tributaries, or if you're near a tributary stream, if there's a buffer on the property and there's land available outside the buffer to rebuild, the county may require you to place the house outside of that buffer. But if there are no buffers on the property, you can put the house in the same spot. If there's no other questions now, um, don't worry. We're still here, as I said. We're not leaving. Um, happy to talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. I thank you all for your attention. I know it was a lot of information, and um, I will be available. Thank you.